Hello, traders. It's 3.30 p.m. Chicago time, 4.30 Eastern on Thursday, the 21st of March, 2019. We're really glad that you're joining us today. And if you're not joining us live, then we're glad you're watching the recording. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be talking with uh, Ira Harris on our uh, anniversary uh, spotlight, trader spotlight segment here uh, of Convergent Trading. Ira is uh, is a very well known trader in our universe. Uh, also, the author of Notes from the Underground. From Underground, uh, we're going to shoot right into it. Uh, I'll start off by saying that uh, derivatives trading is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Just a brief description of what uh, Convergent is. Uh, Convergent. Uh, that sounds like uh, Ira. Yes. You've unmuted. You've unmuted. Uh, yeah. It's pretty. Hmm. Ira, can you mute for a second? There. Oh, he left. <laughs> All right. So, what is convergent trading, uh, and what is our goal for today? Uh, briefly, we're. Well, convergent trading is uh, we're pioneering a, a new path in trading proficiency. It's our goal. We aim to lead the industry through community. Community is very, very important uh, to traders. This is why the advantage is always with prop traders. Uh, when, when we're learning, we believe a strong team is key to any and all success. Um, we are a network of traders and we're committed to growth. The objective today, we aim to just gain some gain a perspective from Ira uh, that is completely different than what we would normally ex uh, normally be exposed to uh, as day traders. We expect to get further insight into the macro traders' approach to trading the markets from an active and highly seasoned trader. So the main thing we seek to get out of today is. The what what does it look like to be an OTF trader or a higher time frame trader? And that's what IRA is. Uh, so we'll start with that. Uh, briefly, IRA comes to us with 42 two years of active trading experience. He's a member of the CME, has served six years on the board of directors of the CME. He's a registered CTA or a trading advisor, commodity trading advisor. He's also a floor broker and also a pool operator. IRA. Are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? Thanks for coming on and uh, really uh, appreciate you taking the time this afternoon from where you are to join us. So we're going to dive right in and we want to hear how did you get introduced to trading? What were the circumstances under which you were uh, brought into the trading world? Can you give us a little bit of that? Yes, uh, Moran. It was... Uh mid 70s and I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin studying political economy under some really great professors and I my mainstay of my work was uh, studying uh, multinational corporations and uh, which were called transnational actors you know there were all types of names from as we were studying them and I studied them from various perspectives but I was at the University of Wisconsin it was a much more uh, radical political uh, group, even though a lot of great professors, and I was looking at it really more from a uh, leftist perspective, but my professors pushed me to learn more and more. So I, that was my expertise in studying those capital flows. And then I decided after my master's and a little bit more that I would leave school because there weren't many jobs. And I had a great knowledge of, uh, I built up a, a deep knowledge of foreign exchange. It was post Bretton Woods. And, um, a friend of my father's had been trained in Chicago, and my dad had said to him, he knows a lot about currencies. He guy says, oh, I'm starting to trade currencies. I wanted to know about the Deutschmark. So I, when I was still at the university, I wrote up a three-page paper for him uh, on the German elections and what the outcome would be for the Deutschmark, and it proved to be pretty predictive. So he kept offering me jobs, and I, didn't re I really didn't want to work at the exchange uh, I wanted to go to Washington. There was a subcommittee on multinationals uh, under uh, Senator Church from Idaho, but that disbanded. So I was kind of left uh, just doing odd things. I was actually roughing high school basketball in, in Chicago, and my parents said it's time, you know. And so, 
So I went to work for him and uh, we became partners and we built a nice currency arbitrage business and I learned about all types of other things. So that's how I came to this business. Wow, that's quite a, an introduction, especially back then. So all you knew about at that point was uh, trading trading on the floor and you had to call your broker and, and get to get a quote and then you might... Uh, tell them what to do at that point and it might take 10 minutes how long did it take when you when you execute a trade back in those days do you know well when i was on the floor i i actually did some executions uh there was a guy who was actually the gold and currency guru and you can go google it he was jim sinclair was very well known and i had gone to uh, a um a uh, uh, meeting in New Orleans, a massive, there were about 2,000 people about gold and currencies. I was kind of interested because I was now getting into the business and I met Jim and I used to fill his orders, believe it or not, and I could get the fills back to him in two or three minutes for large amounts because, you know, I would, I put in a phone in my booth and I, I could just call him directly and give him, so at least he would know the fills, the prices. And then I would, you know, have a couple of clerks cleaning everything up uh, to make sure everything matched. But there were days I was staying till four or five in the afternoon to get everything done. It was an arduous task and it wasn't conducive to creating trades. So we can get into that discussion because uh, of my involvement in, in CME politics. I was on the board for six years through the transition of the IPO and you know, bringing on Globex. I was on the original Globex design committee that Leo Malamed, with his great foresight, put together to have a trader's view. We knew what the technician, we knew what the technical people would do, the IT people, uh, but we wanted to make it trader friendly. So we spent a lot of time putting that together. So I, I have a pretty rich history in, in the comprehensive nature of trading. Well, that's uh, that definitely transformed the exchange uh, for sure. So. In that tenure, in this entire starting in the 70s till today, what, which experience has had the most impact on you as a trader? So we've seen a lot, right, from the 70s, the, the 87 uh, crash, the, the stuff that happened in the early 90s, the dot-com bubble, the housing crisis, uh, several wars, and so on. What experience do you feel had the most impact since you are a global macro, uh, take a global macro perspective on trading? What was the experience that had the most impact on you as a trader? Uh, well, w one that you left out was the Hunt brothers attempt to corner the silver market. Oh, I that's learned correct. a great deal. Yeah, I learned a great deal about that. First of all, about capital flows. I'll tell you why, especially because I had a very good relationship and still do with Jim Sinclair and he taught me a lot through that about how things work. And what most people don't realize is that the reason that the Hunt's effort to corner the market failed was two, two things. Is that the small uh, investor the, went and took their silver out of their attic and, and used to bring it because they could get it melted down for scrap. So silver that wasn't worth much was all of a sudden worth a great deal. And I would, I, when I would go home where I lived in Chicago, I would see people lined up outside pawn shops and, and other types of stores with tea sets and everything. I go, what are they doing? And it was, and it was cold. It was January and February. And I go, wow. And so all that silver came out of the attic. And that's not, uh, it literally came out of the attic. And then when the prices started to slip, and the hunts couldn't uh, meet their margin calls or actually their variation margin calls when the market was starting to go down and they went to the Swiss to borrow money. Of course, what were they borrowing money? They were, the, they were gonna write bonds to the Swiss banks secured by silver. The Swiss understood that the game was over and they helped you know, kick, kick that can over the cliff, kick that. Uh, so that was very interesting. But the biggest moment was in 1989, uh, I believe it was 89, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 89, when uh, Britain decided to, when they announced, when Maggie Thatcher announced what rate she was going to peg the pound to the D mark at, so they, so they would be able to, um, to meet the specifications of being a full-blown member of the EU. And I thought, I had done my analysis, and I thought that 
if they came in at 270, 2.7 D-marks to the pound, that would be very, uh, very rich. And anything higher than that would be ridiculous. So I had a very big position, uh, very big for me uh, in those days. And I was long uh, Deutschmarks and short pounds because I thought the level wouldn't be that. But they did it at 2.90. So it was a, a very uh, bad trade for me. But my sister, who was working for me, she had to stop in the cash market and just executed it and saved me a lot of money. And, and it was the lesson to, that you always live to fight another day. And then when 1992 came around and they actually pulled it because the price they, they answered that was absolutely ridiculous. And they were begging for the problems that they inherited three years later. I lived to fight another day and had one of probably the best day I've ever had as a trader. So it, so it goes to show you. So, so from the Hunt brothers experience, from the Margaret mm -hmm. Thatcher experience, how, what, how did you, how did that, become part of your trader DNA. How do you, what do you take away and apply to future trading from those events, for example? It's a, it's a very good question. So what did it teach me? And I'm still learning the lesson every day because I do a lot of research. I, I, I work at this 12 to 14 hours a day. I'm always reading because even if I'm not trading, I'm reading, I'm I've got a deep background in it, so it's easier for me to do the, the fundamental analysis. And so you have a tendency to get ahead of yourself and to tell the market what it ought to do rather than listening to the market and letting it direct you when the time is right to make the trade. And I think that's, that's the thing that you have to keep learning, that the market is a gigantic force. Yes, you can see these things. And what it really synthesizes down to is, of course, what uh, – uh, is attributed to John Maynard Keynes, and you have to pay attention to it, is that markets can remain irrational far, far longer than you and I can remain solvent. Right. And it's all a derivation of that. And so that's a very important lesson, especially for one who works so hard at and thinks that I know as much as I do. So, uh, you know, there's, as I teach people, when, when I got down to the floor, there, there was a saying, and if you come to the floor with a large ego, with a large ego and a large uh, savings account, soon you'll be left with a large ego. So you always want to pay attention at the game. The game is to know when you're wrong. So no matter, I'm at the point in my life where I put on, if I'm thinking about putting on a trade and I'm wondering how come I can be the only one seeing this. So my first inclination is, uh, if I'm wrong, where am I wrong, and how do I limit the loss? It's the most important thing that I that I have to deal with day in and day out. So we have a, a person who's to this day, after 42 years of trading, still emphasizing risk first, so that you can survive it and keep keep your business, keep trading tomorrow, which is something that's so uh, people talk about it and there are books about it, but it's so unsexy that people don't want to hear about it, but it's the truth. Like how do you come back and trade tomorrow? If your risk of ruin today on this current trade is so high that you're not going to survive it. So that's a great point. Now, I know that you provide advisory services for funds and institutions and so, so on. What sort of help do those participants in the market need that uh, they would call you out for? What, what sorts of things do you do for them? Well, here's what I learned. And, and let me just take a minute. You know, I was taught about risk reward and how to, and how to protect yourself by the person who brought me into the business when I became his partner until the, he passed away in uh, 2015. They've Lenny Feldman, one of the great characters down at the exchange, but he knew about, you know, risk and, and how do you limit it? And he always drummed into my head. And it's true for all traders today. Today, commissions, the commission structure is so uh, low that you can enter and exit a trade three or four times, five times, six times before you get it right. Cause you may be seeing it and you take those small losses. And he would say to me, you're, you know, you're paying professional fees. They're minimus. Don't be afraid to keep getting in and out. It's not like you're a, a retail customer paying $60 a round turn. And yes, $60 a round turn was not unusual back in the 70s and early 80s for people trading in the futures business. Um, so now 
let me um, you let, let me uh, directly entertain that question you asked. I, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I just wanted to get that point across. Sure. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. You. It's you know we know we provide advisory services for funds and institutions. What sort of help yep. do they need? Well, you know, it's like everybody else. If they think that they know everything, they're in trouble. So a lot of times they'll use me to bounce things off of, well, we're seeing this. Uh, and they're, they pay a lot of money for consultants outside of that. And I have certain people who call me and I go, well, you know, when I ask you to pay me what I think I deserve, uh, you're not willing to pay me, but you want to call me. And I have one person specifically who said, he said, I've got all these banks, but you've really been more right than anybody else. And a lot of times they want to hear what I'm thinking long term. You know, I always have to explain to people, I'm a trader. So I can trade in and out of these things four or five, six times, or I may exit a trade well before it's run its full course and may still have momentum and thinking I can get back in them. But my long-term views for people who are more long-term investors are really uh, grounded. And, and I'd have to say very good. I'm not going to say pretty good. Very good. I, I've had, you know, listen, I've been on with Rick Santelli. When, when the yield curve, the 210 was trading 120, I said, we're probably going to go down to 74 basis points uh, as it starts to flatten. I'd be careful there. And it bounced off of there several times. And then I said, well, if it gets through there, we're going a lot flatter. And this was two years ago. So, you know, people call me and remind me that. But this is a business where, you know, everybody's looking to shoot holes at you over nothing because everybody wants to knock you down. I don't care. You Which know, is not a bad thing, really, right? That's not a bad thing no, because it causes you to, to pause. And of course, if they come with an argument, it causes you to pause and it acts as a check on your logic uh, as opposed to something that's just bruising your ego, right? If, if somebody exactly. Says, and as I, as, right? As we're doing right now, I don't need validation. The market, my, my P&L will validate me. I don't need your validation. But I like the discourse. My the blog that I write provides great discourse. I have great readership all over the world. You know what? For a while, you know, you get what I call whack jobs who show up who are just looking for any kind of platform because they're bored. They want to argue. We have yeah. a. They just want to argue. You know what? I had a, my brother Ralph may rest in peace. He liked to argue. It was good for me. It taught me a lot. He was an older brother. But I'm not looking to argue. I, I'm looking to discuss. You know, when I was in graduate school, I laughed because every night a friend of mine, uh, Kevin McCarthy, just left. Who's, he was staying with me. I'm down here in Arizona. And he just left a couple hours ago. And we had long discussions. But him and I would sit and I, would, and I had, had a severe Marxist bent. I've, I've read a lot of Marxist economics, a lot of Marxist philosophy. And we would sit every night with a guy who was writing his uh, dissertation on uh, Hayek's Constitution of Liberty. And we would sit there. It, have, you know, we were poor graduates and we, had, and we would have beer and they would give us pizza at the end of the night and that would be my meal because they were going to throw it out anyway and we would sit <laughs> for hours and we could have legitimate discourse. There was no argument. There, there was discussion, you know, and if you made a point and somebody said, you know, well, here, you know, and you could, of course you had to defend us because that was a great part of being in graduate school because you were going to walk into a, 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 a seminar and get beat up by some professor anyway. So it was really good training. And it's not, a, you know, if you need validation, you know, go get, uh, get a dog. The market you know, is not the place to do that. that. Yeah. And also yeah. I, I find it really interesting that you had a Marxist bent and here you are trading in this extremely capitalist market, you know, this, this auction that we participate in every day. So just to wrap up the uh, background, um, uh, portion of this uh, of this spotlight because we want to get into trading and trading methodology. Uh, you have a blog you just mentioned called Notes from Underground. Uh, of course, any uh, viewer can go to this website uh, iragharris.com and you can add yourself uh, to the to the blog so you can read it when it comes out. It's it's a fun read. I've been, uh, I don't, we met what, like a month or six weeks ago at the, at the shooting of the Futures TV show. And ever since uh, I, I subscribed and I, I read it, uh, I, I, th I find some of your um, commentary pretty, uh, pretty funny. How are you managing to keep this flow of information going on your blog? You've been doing this for 10 years. 
I mean, for like I, I have a website and uh, used to have a blog on it, and that got really tedious for me to sit down and write something on a consistent basis like you do. Like where does this flow of information come from uh, that keeps you going for so long? I, copious amounts of reading. Um, I just read, and you know, and a lot of my readers will send me things that I may miss, and I'll read them. And I, and because I have uh, so many years of doing this, I, I can see through some nonsense. I can see through the redundancy. I'm probably writing less right now because everything we see before us is redundant. It, we're not on to anything new right now. Uh, Draghi's. Uh, press conference. I listen to all those. I read. Der, I read the Der Spiegel. I I read French uh, newspaper. I and I've probably read the most important book on Europe uh, written in the last thirty years. And he's become a good friend of mine uh, through our discussions over his book, The Rotten Heart of Europe by Bernard Connolly. It's a great read. And whether you agree with it or not, doesn't matter. It's got encyclopedic uh, information about what's what took place to the buildup of the euro currency. And he wrote the book in 1995. Uh, and it, it's so prescient that it's unbelievable. And then at a prodding of uh, Bill Shepard and myself, Bill Shepard from the CME, who's a very good friend of mine, in fact, I cleared through his clearinghouse. Um, we got Bernard to write a new forward in 2012. And Bill and I paid to have the book come out of print because there were only like two or 300 copies left and people were paying six, $700 on Amazon for the book. I know I was trying to buy a couple of copies for people. <laughs> I owned one that I found. So it's, you know, I, I read and the back, my background being so deep, it's very easy for me to see through a lot of the nonsense that is, you know, posed out there because don't forget in the financial world, you have to be able to discern who's trying to sell you something and who's really trying to promote thinking and, and generate thoughtful ideas in which to make profits from. I mean, that's what, you know, as I like to say in my blog, I don't, you know, I, I quote uh, Deng Xiaoping, which is, I don't care whether the cat is white or black, as long as it catches mice. Right. I, I, I have no, I have no ideological bent. I try to stay as far away from politics as I can. If I pick on Trump, it's not, because I'm a Republican or Democrat, I don't care. It's because I think that what he has done is ill-advised and stupid, and can we make money from it? I don't care about your politics. I, I don't. And if you can tell my politics, then I haven't done a very good job because I, I really should keep it out of there. <laughs> okay. So we're going to move on to trading methodology. What, how would you describe a global macro trader? What, what is a global macro trader, just briefly? I, I would say it's somebody who monitors uh, all aspects of the global financial system, mostly money, because then you follow the money flows. And I, and I ask myself various questions from that, which is if Mexico is paying 8% and the United States is paying 2% and money keeps flowing into the United States, what's the problem? So then I start there and I start analyzing because who, who's going to pay away 6%? What, what is the advantage that you're looking at or what's the problem over there? So that's the mindset. And you learn various lessons over time, just like I did with the British pound in 89 and then again in 92. Um, and, you, and you learn to discern uh, what's really going on in the world. And it bleeds into commodities, it bleeds into bonds, it bleeds into equities. There's so much, but it all stems out of those cash flows. That's really what my matrix is. And that's the that's the macro part, just looking at the flow of money around the globe. Correct. So, can you give us an example of a trade, or uh, and 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 tell us uh, this is incorrect here, and tell us um, how how a trade would be conceived? How do you set it up in terms of risk reward, the entry, how you execute, and how you manage it? So, several parts there. Uh, you know, you have a bias or an idea for a certain currency pair or maybe uh, a, 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 an interest rate spread or something like that. So you form that bias through your analysis and you talked a little bit about that analysis, just looking at money flows, looking at 
how, what moves uh, central banks are making, how the market's responding, how the yield curve's responding, and so on. But once that's that trade is uh, so, we just give us an example of a trade, a recent trade, or a trade that you're thinking about, mm -hmm. and tell us how you came up with the idea. How do you set it up? Like, how do you define your risk in in such a big picture uh, trade? How do you enter, and how you execute and manage it? Okay, it's it's uh, so it's in my blog. I don't in my blog. I don't tout trades. Meaning, oh, do this. I'll. I'll suggest this for what I'm reading, and then I'll tell you to go do your technical homework. But every once in a while, I will put levels out there, 200-week moving average, 200-day moving average. And those are only important because uh, I, I believe that markets have a lot of mean reversion to them. When things run too hard, too fast, uh, I'll get out of trades, even if they're working, because I expect them to be to revert somewhat. You know, you if you've got... Uh, 20 or 25 percent above the 200 day moving average of 20, it may be enough for a while and i'll wait for the pullback that's but well, let me give you a because i had it in the blog about uh, i don't know two months ago my timeline maybe a little bit off but not much and i talked about the 530 uh yield curve what i call the speculators curve rather than the 210 which is the institutional investor curve so and that's just market, to be clear, uh, Ira. That's the five-year uh, futures versus the thirty-year versus the yeah. thirty-year futures. That's what he when he's saying five right. thirty. That's what what's meant by that. Go ahead. Right, and there's an established ratio. Bloomberg uh, prints it, but you can find it. This as a CME site may have it about how many because it's based on volatility. So let's say that it's five. It's four five years to one thirty. So mm -hmm. I was watching the market. The stock market was was starting to, you know, it was recovering from its December fall, but a lot of people had put on some steepeners that the Fed would have to, you know, with the fall of the stocks, that the Fed would be more, more may even cut rates in order to save the market. So, um, so uh, people had put on steepeners, but once the market started to, to satisfy, they came back and they started buying their 30 years back and selling the five years. So putting on, getting out of those and flattening. So the curve went from about 55 steep down to 32. And it was still a positive curve, but that was quite a bit of flattening in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. Well, the 32, 33 area was the 200 day moving average. So I put it in the blog. I said, this is what I'm doing. I think this trade is still going to work. I think these curves have to steepen based on even with the equity markets. So the 30, I was risking literally, and I used the closes to establish if it'll blows through there, I'm out of there. But if it closes above it or right at it, I may get out and watch for it to stay. So I said, I'm using that as my close because it's a, it's a 200 day. It's a little term, more long term. So I put it on at 33. Uh, I got out of it a little bit early because it ran up over the next two, three weeks up to 55. In fact, yesterday it made a new high for the last 52 weeks at 65 after the Fed meeting. But I, those are trades. But I established my loss first. So I knew exactly where I wanted to, to, to lose, you know, what my risk was. And if I was wrong, I was wrong. And if it was going to continue flattening, fine. But so, I was willing to take that risk there because that's what my work had told me, that the long end of the curve ought to steepen. And I, and I stress ought. I speak a lot in ought because that's what I think is going to happen. It doesn't mean that it's definitely going to happen. And I don't know the timeline of it happening. Right. We I'm don't just, know until it happens, right? Exactly. exactly. Any trader knows that. So, um, so you define your risk. This is a spread trade. You define your risk. Do you look for a certain uh, what they call an R factor, which means you know a, a, a number of uh, a multiplier of reward to risk? Like you maybe you know spreads don't require that much margin um, to initiate. Um, you might you know let's just throw some numbers out there. Let's just say you're risking you know fifteen hundred bucks on this trade. Do you say well unless I can see it going far enough for me to make three thousand dollars? to get a two R or two reward to risk, then I'm not going to put this trade on. Or how are you getting your, your hands around how much risk you're taking for the potential reward? Well, it, it depends upon how long I'm looking to stay in a trade. Because sometimes I'll see just 
immediate value, like on a day when the unemployment data comes out, or yesterday with the FOMC. Mm -hmm. I do, will these trades have staying power? I have to discern that, but I may see immediate value, and I'll put the trade on, and I may leave it on for an hour. I may leave it on for, even if it's working, I may leave it on for for two, three days, four days. With with some of these yield curve plays, I put them on for longer term duration, uh, but that doesn't mean I won't trade them because I'll see different things that I think will move the market and may correct. Uh, yesterday, classic point. I bought the gold as fast as I could after I heard the Fed statement and I discerned it and I thought this was just so beyond any dovishness that anybody else had out there. I think BMO uh, had an analysis that they were looking for an announcement that the uh, quantitative tightening, as Peter Bookvar would call it, was going to end in September, and they proved to be right. Most people had December. So every aspect of that was was very dovish, and the gold had closed a little soft. So as soon as I could buy it, I did, and it got up to a resistance level overnight at about 1320. So I was busy taking profits uh, when it bounced off there, it couldn't go through that 1320 level, which I had as a, a, a pretty big resistance area. Yeah. And now, and then I was, the, the high was 1320 and 20 cents, 1320 and 20 right. cents. So and you, you, you left 20 cents on the table, two ticks. I, well, yeah. You need to refine I, I your plan. Between, <laughs> yeah, no, I got up between, uh, 16 and a half and 18 and a half. Cause I had to see what was going to go on, uh, to see whether it was just resting because it had a pretty good move. But then I'm out, and now I bought them back, but I bought them back a little too early because I have a bigger view, but I was selling some currency against it because that's been my play is gold against all currencies. It's just not a dollar play. In fact, it really hasn't been a dollar play, but that's one I've been discussing in my blog for a long time, and I like the gold, and people say, well, you know, because most pundits will come on television and go, there's no inflation. That's not why I like the gold. To me, gold is a hedge against deflation because if we were to go into disinflation right now the central banks of the world would panic and that's what gold is truly a hedge against central bank panic so uh they put themselves in a bad situation i trade it i'm not married to it because we're locked in a range here it's performed pretty well but this is one you know again there's a lot of mean reversion it ran up too too fast uh a couple of weeks ago, I had the, the gold Swiss on, and the move was about uh, 22, 23% in a couple of weeks, way too quick. So when it showed itself against resistance, you know, I take it off and I look to, to you know, to resettle. The worst part, of course, is if it were to keep going, then you, you're kicking yourself, but then you got to go on to your next trade. You cannot concentrate on what you don't have, you know, that FOMO. I don't, I never suffer FOMO. I wish you all great success. And that's the great thing about being a currency trader is that you don't have a contrarian nature because mm -hmm. I could stand on the floor of the IMM and everybody on the floor could be long the Deutschmark and it's going higher. The people who are short are somewhere else in the world, whether a bank trading room, an institution, but everybody can be long. The customers can be long, everybody on the floor. And that's something that a lot of people, you know, because there are, a lot of commodity traders, future traders, are contrarian by nature, thinking, well, if the public is long, I have to be short because they can't possibly write. As a currency trader, I never gave in to that. And it's really helped me because I'm not contrarian by nature. Got it. So um, does your entry price matter that much to you? Do you have to get a certain price to enter a trade? <laughs> it doesn't have to be exact, especially that's something I've learned over the last 10, 11 years as I have to adjust my trading to the algos and the high frequency, because I'm, I'll never be a high frequency trader. I was never a great pit trader. I, I'd rather fill orders than scalp in the pit. Mm -hmm. But if I see value, I see value. So a lot of times uh, what I use when, when there's information or data coming out that I deem to be important data, I put in wish orders, which if the market is, I think, you know, if it gets a surprise, this should be a level where I'm willing to enter on a value basis. Yeah, I'm almost thinking like Warren Buffett, oh, there's great value here. Mm -hmm. So I'll put in wish orders. And they're in uh, before, and sometimes you get filled on them. And, and now wish, I have a wish order. 
A wish order is one where you you think it's so far off, it's never going to, it's a limit order that stays in place, probably good till canceled, yep. and it just, you think it's so far off, it's probably not going to get filled. But if it does, you're going to be very happy that it does because it's so far out of what, what you think is a reasonable price. And you put those out there looking for surprises, essentially, right? It, Exactly. You know, would that be an R2 or, or R3? You know, right. I don't care, but that's where I'm willing to make my stand. I have a big view already. If you're going to drive that level to me, which which happens in the algorithm, because for a long time, until recently, on, on data release days, we would see the high frequency and algos be turned off because they didn't want to get caught. Mm. So the volatility would increase because there weren't as many you know, active people. So if stops got elective, they weren't there. And if my order was there, I'm getting satisfied. So, you know, on more than rare occasion, on a rare occasion, I will get them. So yesterday I didn't, I was, I, I had to listen too much. Uh, and I wasn't sure, you know, cause, cause there's a lot of nuance between the uh, FOMC statement and then the press conference. I'm not a big fan of the press conferences, uh, but yeah, I have to live with them because was- now Jay Powell wants to do them. The reaction there was very odd, right? So it uh, it took off, uh, at least the equities took off higher, and it ended up right back to where, uh, to the prices where the announcement was made by the end of the day. The 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 the, the major the participants, at least in equities, which is what I trade, um, ended up just kind of dismissing what was uh, released, and then here we come in today, and we just shoot straight up on a trend up day in equities. Uh, and also the, yeah. the dollar and gold were up today, you know? Yeah, right. Well, the gold was already up yesterday. See, yep. that's the problem. You have a, you have a pit close, Chicago uh, 1230 gold pit closes. That's when they say, because you got to establish what you're going to meet your uh, margin variation at. So they have to establish that price. So at 1230, so at 1230, the gold had closed at 1301.50. But by the by the four o'clock Globex close, it had already gone up to uh, 13, 13, 13, 14, went higher during night. So it was already there. So people get, they pick up that quote and it's really wrong because you have to watch until the market really closes at four o'clock central time uh, Globex yeah. to see what the price really is because it already had picked that up. So I would say that gold actually closed lower today, but not on your screen. Okay, so what do you focus on when you are executing a trade? So you've got your idea, and I'm kind of, sounds like a repeated question, but here, now you're going to engage with the market on this gold trade or whatever. Is there anything in particular that you want to see before you click the button to put your trade out there on, you know, FOMC or NFP or anything, really just a normal trade? Or is it, hey, as long as it's in between X and Y, and here I am, the market's open, I'm just going to go put it out there. Uh, it, which method do you use? Do you do you just put it on and figure it's a two, three day trade or a few hour trade? It doesn't really matter. Or are you paying attention to things like order flow and what's coming in and what's going out? How do you do that? Yes. So all of the above. But what I like to do, and I think this is what my great expertise is, is yes, there's a classic case. So I was able to buy the gold after the FOMC uh, statement came out, and I was able to buy it at uh, 1305 and a half, 1306, and I was looking to put back uh, uh, the the gold currency spread. So I knew that the the dollar was going to sell off, and I was looking to put on gold Swiss because the Swiss bank met this morning and I knew that they were, or I, I knew, I, I was 95% sure that they weren't going to change anything because that's, if you read any of the speeches that they make or listen, that's where they are. And they don't want the currency as, as their statement today said, any stronger. So I figured they wouldn't do anything, but the, but the Swiss rallied with it. So I let the, the Swiss rally and then I put the other leg on. Now, do I have a science to it? No, but I'll look for my technical levels where, okay, I could sell it here because it's pretty defined and it should, it should hold this resistance area. So I'm able to, to maneuver a trade that I want to put on and I never use the, uh, the auto spreader. 
because I always figure my expertise is I can do this better. I look for my reads. I, Loren, I know people go crazy, but I have so many variables up. I have cash currencies on front of me. I have 130, 164 matrix up right now. Bond prices all over the world. Currency, cash currency prices, emerging market, uh, equity markets, the bond. I, 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 I watch this and commodities. So I'm looking for different keys that will lead me to it. It's not easy, and, and I have to get up from it because, it's, you know, it, it's, it's arduous and sometimes overwhelming, but that's what I look for. I look for my keys, and when I'm doing spreads, which I do a lot of relative value trades, I'm looking for my edge, and my edge is what my knowledge is. It's what I work for, so if I can get that level, that's what I'll do it. So just to establish a periodicity or, or something, because most of us here are day traders, really, uh, and learning more and more about uh, the macro view through you. Uh, what time frame chart are you looking at right before you click the button in, for example, gold at FOMC? What is okay. that chart? So, a 60 so, minute or a 15 minute or a day? I, 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 like, I like to use two, 240 minute charts. 240, okay. Gives me a look. Yeah, because I, you know, it, it shows me. Uh, uh, a broader picture, of course, I'm on CQG. I'm not advertising for CQG, but I've used CQG for so many years. I'm just an old guy who's, you know, accustomed to it. I may change because the cost is starting to get <laughs> bother me. And there's so much more out there that I could, you know, like internet, you know, there's just a lot of sure. alternatives. So I have to start looking at other charts, but my eyeballs are so, uh, uh, custom to uh, CQG and I'm uh, very familiar with every way everything works. But um, so, you know, I, so I like to look at the 240. If I'm looking for a longer duration, like on a Friday, I, I really peer into the, the 200 week because Friday closes uh, become very important based on a longer duration period. Because if people are willing to take home a trade over a weekend, there's a, there's a lot of uh, conviction then. And I like to see where the conviction is. Mm -hmm. So it all depends what day of the week it is, uh, where I'm at. And again, I, I like to see momentum. Uh, so the the 200 day, the 200 week give you a good picture of what the momentum markets are. And if markets are going sideways, that's fine too. I love sideways markets. I love when markets grind in a very tight range over a long period of time because I know that they're going to come out of there. And I don't care which way they come out of there. I may have uh, a, um, I, I may have an inclination as to what side I'm looking for based on some of my fundamental analysis, but it's okay. Let them grind. I'm, it's okay. I, 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 if I was a better trader, I would trade more options, but it's the one part of my trade that I never did enough of. And yet I'm starting to use some option uh, more to express things. Uh, so that's, that's to my advantage, but it's a very weak link in my trading, even though all my ideas can be expressed in various options. So I look for those types of strategies. But I look, I like the 240 day, uh, okay. 240 out, uh, 240 minute uh, chart. So on on the 240 minute, do you have any indicators at all? Do you have any like, um, you know, you talked about a 200 week moving average, so that's an indicator. On your 240 though. What what <coughs> stuff is on there? You know, you have your bars, you have your probably volume histogram, maybe. What sorts of things, uh, indicator style things, do you put on there? You know, do you use a MACD? Uh, do you use anything like that? Yeah, I, a little bit, but I use oscillators because I like to see if there's some divergence. Because if you're getting price action uh, one way and the and you're not getting the momentum through the oscillator, then there's a little divergence telling you to be cautious. There's a guy out there, MSA Mike Oliver, who is older than I am, but he's been around and trained by uh, Bob Farrell, who's great at understanding momentum and price. And for him, even momentum is even more important. So when you get divergence between the two, and I was taught this by a very great technician who I used to employ for 25 years, he taught me that that importance too is that the oscillators become important because of the divergence from price and when they diverge be attentive because if price is running ahead of momentum you're not getting the type of bull that you ought to get or or bear so be be where it might be at the end of the move so i pay attention to those but not much yeah really not much 
So which oscillator is your favorite? 20. What type of oscillator? 20, is it? Uh, 20 minutes and 60. Yeah, I have 20 days, 60, you know, and it'll pick up a lot of this stuff. And then I'll go look at volume, of course. And for anybody, I, I overlay everything with volume because if the volume is not there, you know, if the market is rallying on, on low volume, the rally can either be short covering or there's not a lot of interest in the market. And, you know, it just tells me to be cautious. Trade it with a very, with very tight stops, as I always do anyway, but to be very leery of low volume bull markets, hmm. especially low volume bull markets. Be very leery of them. And they can, those, those can go far, though. <laughs> I mean, it, sometimes even if it's low volume, it just goes and goes and goes. So what is a typical trading day for you? When do you get up? When do you get to your terminal? When do you stop? Uh, it sounds like you're almost a 19-hour uh, trader or something based on how much reading yeah. and so on. But what, what is a typical day for Ira? Well, I, now you know, because of the time changes, it's a little bit different. So I'll trade the European bonds, which open at, uh, I have to think, uh, 2 o'clock Chicago time now. Uh, 2 so I'll be up till, tw yeah, 2 a.m. Because if I'm, if I'm involved, if not, but the European bonds will show you a lot, right? especially now with the ECB and everything that's going on. So I think that they, they show a lot for a global macro trader, uh, especially because the ECB supposedly is not in uh, actively adding to their balance sheet. So you get to see interest. You get to see who's chasing yields. Are they buying Italian bonds today versus everything? Well, if they are, if you want to buy Italian bonds, you must be in a mode to be chasing yields. How are they affecting the equity market? So I have to be attentive to that. Uh, I usually sleep about, I get, I try to get between six and seven. I'll take a nap here and there. Uh, and I, and I have, and I have a life. So I'll go play golf. I'll go. I like to run. That's my really great escape is long distance running. So I'm, I like to put on my shoes and run, whether it's outside or on a treadmill. Nice. Uh, Cause you can't sit in front of the screen all day. You get so stale. Uh, I'll go sit outside. I'll go somewhere. I'll go read. I, I just, you know, you cannot sit and watch this. So I try to be there for what I deem to be the most active periods. So uh, the transition, uh, I like to be there around when uh, the, I'm so geared to currency trading. So I'm always at my desk at seven th by 7.20 uh, uh, central time, <clears throat> even though now in Arizona, but even Chicago, I'm usually heading down to the office when I'm when I'm in Chicago, which I am for a good part. Uh, I'm on the road at a quarter to six in the morning to get to the office. It takes me about 15 minutes. I just live on the outskirts of the city, so 15 minutes. I get there, uh, and I'm I'm geared because I've already done my work anyway. Because I've read a lot at night. So where other people may be watching television, I've already read tomorrow's FT. I, I don't read the journal. I get, people send me articles in the journal. The FT has been my go-to, although I'm getting a little tired of it because I think the I think the quality of the reporting has diminished dramatically. Um, the world over. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I and I but now I've started subscribing to the uh, the uh, South China Morning Post. I find that to be they actually have some pretty quality article. I read foreign affairs. I read foreign policy. Um, I, I, I'm on the Bloomberg. I don't have a Bloomberg, but I'm on the Bloomberg.com uh, site. Uh, I'm talking to people. I, you, you can't believe it. I carry my computer with me when I go on vacation only so I can clean out the emails. And I'm not talking junk emails. I'll get 200 quality emails a day with people sending me stories. Did you see this? Did you see that? So it's a constant flow of this, you know? And, and, and again, because my, because my foundation is so great, I could, you know, win my way through this and do it much more quickly than anybody else can for, for me. You know, this is garbage. Just say, you know, whatever. Okay. So um, we're just going to get to, we're just getting to the point where we need to get to the Q&A, but uh, is there a market that you wouldn't trade? Is there a market that you just will not touch? You know, I, I trade a lot of grains. I've never traded a lot of uh, meats, hogs, cattle, uh, and I don't know why that is. I, every once in a while I'll trade them. It's not that I wouldn't touch them, 
I just, I don't know. I just never got my comfort there. That's a bad thing because you should trade, especially in today's electronic world. I mean, there were markets I wouldn't touch back in the eighties and nineties and early because you know what? I didn't like the execution, uh, certain markets in New York. I would never trade. Uh, I was always angry that I had to trade the COMEX to tell you the truth, because I was never a fan of the execution. Uh, but you got to go where you got to go. And I've traded a lot of metals for a long time, but in today's electronic world, no, because everything's at the press of the button. So I, I can't say that there's not anything that I won't trade, but every market that I trade, I have to be able to execute, to exit from immediately. So Mm -hmm. it's got to have substantial flow for me to feel comfortable. Because if I feel like I can't get out at literally the press of a button at a a level that I deem to be somewhat respectable or, or at least have a chance, then I won't trade. But I can't name any of them off the top of my head, especially as we've gone electronic. Do you... Do you do any uh, energy uh, trading at all? Do you look at crude? I mean, that's yes. that's a macro product, well, right? Yes, uh, natural gas. I, I like to trade natural gas. I trade crude. Um, <clears throat> it's a mandatory product to trade. And it generates a lot of other trades for me. Because, you know, what people don't understand is that in the 70s, it was the petrodollar. Because that's what they got. They got OPEC to take dollars. And you know, a lot of the, the things that I learned about took place because of that role of the dollar. So oil is very, very important uh, for financial markets, very important. And of course, the OPEC nations are all sovereign wealth funds. They've got massive amounts of, uh, of investable capital. So you, you need to be very aware of it. It affects Mexico. I love to trade Mexico. In fact, I, I, I'm, as I, the more I read, if they can, deal with, they can get rid of the corruption, I'm bullish Mexico. But it'll take a while and people get more comfortable with AMLO. But if China, you know, I, I view now, like I view Australia as always a proxy for China. Mexico will become a proxy for China because if the tariffs come off and all this and China were to all of a sudden announce that they were going to import all these goods from, from the U.S., a lot of those supply lines now are linked to Mexico. And the Mexican mm-hmm. peso on a relative basis is historically and phenomenally cheap. But again, that's one where I'm ahead of myself and I know that, so I try to find other trades and oil affects, of course, that viewpoint heavily. So yeah, I trade a lot of energy and more importantly, I pay attention to energy. Very cool. So we're gonna go into a rapid fire here, uh, quick fire Q and A, and then we'll open it up to any questions that uh, the, the viewers may have. First question, what do you see as the hot play in the next six to 12 months? You kind of alluded to that with uh, just now with the, uh, you gave us a little nugget with the uh, China Mexico correlation. Um, so what do you see in the next six to 12 months in the, in the macro world that you'd be interested in monitoring? Well, uh, I'm looking at these yield curves cause I've, I still believe that debt matters. I know it's part of the uh, argument today and I love the argument because it's, forced me to do a lot of work and a lot of analysis. But the, what the Fed did yesterday, to me, is going to steepen these curves out because the Fed wants them to steep and they're nervous that these curves have flattened and for what the flattening may mean historically. So I can't time it for you. And, I, and I've been on record for 20 years saying that, 25 years. I can't time what the curve flattenings mean. And in 2007, it helped me make a lot of money seeing those curves invert. I knew that, uh, especially the 210 I'm referring to there. So I'm looking those for these curve actions to reverse. Right now, the 210 is flattening while the 530 has been steepening. So this is of interest too, but because of the vast amount of debt that's in the world, um, I think that the dollar is suspect. I'm not, wild. in fact, when I was on with Anthony Cradelli, uh when we met, uh, six weeks ago or so, we talked about that. I'm not, I'm not bullish the dollar. I think that the dollar has a lot of problems here, and I think we have an administration that doesn't want a higher dollar, and I think the Fed is now signed on to this because I think the Fed's viewpoint comes from a global viewpoint that the world is slowing, and they're not looking to do anything to further strengthen the dollar. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's my view. I'm, I'm not making the play yet. I'm watching closely. 
I've got some, I caught the 530. I'm out of the 530, but I'm looking to establish a steepener being long twos and short tenure. Right now, the technicals do not favor it. So I'm, that's my inherent feeling, but I will let the market tell me. And I think over the next six to 12 months, this is going to be a very interesting play. Will it take a Fed rate cut? I have to think about that because mm-hmm. it's certain a rate cut is more a possibility now than it was Tuesday because Jay Powell's very dovish speech and press conference made it so, made it so. And of course, you know, uh, part of the problem with the curve, which some people have talked about, and I know Jim Grant, who I have great respect for, was on CNBC and he talked about it yesterday, is because of the vast amount of treasury issuance because the deficit is so high, so high. One of my main themes going forward is, look it, the economy is supposedly good. And I'm not going to argue with that. But if it's that good, why is our deficit at a trillion dollars? If you're at full employment, you're supposed to be running under Keynesian economics. You're supposed to be running a budget surplus, not a trillion dollar deficit. So there's a lot of things wrong here. So I'm waiting for these to play out a little bit. But I think that these are going to bear fruit over the six, next six to 12 months. And with that, I'm looking for gold to take out that, you know, I'm, I'm long gold, but I'll be long gold against all the currencies. Because if the Fed, as uh, Alexandra Harris of Bloomberg yesterday on Bloomberg Radio said, and she happens to be my daughter, and this had nothing to do with me, but she's a <laughs> very good journalist. She's a very good journalist at, at Bloomberg. And she asked, they said, what question you would they asked her, what question would you ask Jay Powell? And she said, what are you so afraid of? And even with the equity markets going up, if you're not asking yourself, what is the Fred so afraid of to have made this pivot so quickly, then you're not doing your homework. Okay. So uh, we're running out of time here, Ira. I mm-hmm. uh, just want to ask these and see if you can uh, just give us a kind of a uh, – one sentence answer. What is the biggest mistake that you've you have made or have seen traders uh, make in trading? The biggest mistake traders make is believing that they're right and the market is wrong. That's it. There is no bigger mistake. Okay, and probably not defining how much you're willing to bet to figure that out. Um, yeah, correct. The next question I have for you is uh, this is. Um, uh, a question that we ask all of our um, uh, guests. If someone important to you was getting into trading today, that someone could actually be you even, uh, a, a young buck you, what key three points would you make sure they know to help them succeed? Uh, number one, that you know yourself well enough that you know that what your risk parameters are. And knowing your risk parameters are, knowing that you know how to lose money. That's first and foremost. Two, spend time learning the fundamentals. Even if you're not a fundamentalist, you have to know what the market is thinking so that when you get divergent action, you can take advantage of it. Because that's as important. When a market ought to do something and it goes the other way, that may be the best opportunity you ever have had to make money. And three, Learn everything you can about bond markets because bond markets are the mainstay of the global financial system and everything does show up there. And I know they're, it's boring. When I teach, and I, I teach, I give a lot of seminars on college uh, classes, uh, upper level finance classes, and they look at me because everybody wants to be an equity trader. Learn the bond markets, learn them on a domestic basis, and learn them on a global basis. Critical to being a good global macro trader. Hmm. Okay. Um, just want to remind everybody that uh, you can, uh, it's, a, it's free, uh, you can add your name or email, an email to Ira's um, uh, blog at uh, iragharris.com. You see it in front of you on the screen. Uh, Yoda, do we have any questions that we may not have touched on? We have a few. One was asking, why did you decide to trade gold rather than bonds during the FOC announcement yesterday? How in general do you decide which markets to trade in order to express your macro sentiment that you have? 
Uh, it's a good question. I was already, I already had some steepeners on, so I was just willing to watch them. Yes, I could have lifted a leg, but my focus became as soon as I heard the dovishness. I'm not sure that the bonds were going to rally, to tell you the truth. You know what? And, and let me give you a quick lesson that I learned back in uh, 1989, 1990. I was long the British gilts, which are the 10-year British bonds, in anticipation of the Bank of England cutting rates. And lo and behold, I got four rate cuts in a row from the Bank of England, a quarter point, quarter point, quarter point. And I was long gilts, and all I did was lose money. So I should have been in the short end. The long end, yields on the long end actually went higher. And that was a great learning experience for me. So I'm not always sure when you get a dovish signal that the bonds are going to rally. And let's go back to 2010, 2011. Those curves, when the, when the Fed embarked upon QE1, the curves and QE2, the curves actually steepened because most people thought that this was going to be very inflationary, so they didn't run to the long end. So that was my eye where I thought for sure gold Oh, for sure. I, I thought a higher probability of gold. I never sure, but a higher probability that gold would rally and it did. So that was my, that, that was my thinking. Mm, okay. Question. Do you ever look at value area highs and lows? This is a market profile sure. term. Do you, do you yeah. look at market profile at all? I guess is really the questions and the details. I, I don't, you know, you know, it's not my comfort zone. Again, I've, uh, been dependent on certain types of technical analysis, uh, Fibonacci, uh, trend, uh, again, the oscillators, moving averages. So with all those, that's what I'm comfortable with. I, I have not gone to the, these market profile. Not that they don't work. I'm not saying that at all. It's just, you know, that's my comfort level. And the way that I analyze the market has been kind of geared, you know, I gear the technicals to that type of analysis to show me what I'm looking for. So no, and it's probably to my detriment, but I, I can't be everywhere. <laughs> okay, the bank of the the bank of international settlements will classify gold as a risk free asset on March 29th. How do you think this will affect the gold in a global sense? I, I didn't know that to be. That's interesting. So I'm glad somebody brings that up. I'm going to have to go investigate. If it's a risk free asset, it'll be bullish to gold because you can hold it on. And that's the same, you know, I have a big problem with BIS um, and I read a lot of their work uh, that sovereign debt, all sovereign debt is carried. Well, I won't say all, I'm sure there's some that fall through the cracks, but developed market debt, uh, all European sovereign debt carries a zero risk weighting, which means, which has allowed the European banks to all load up and stuff themselves with Italian bonds, you know, whatever, in search for yield because there's no reserve required. They don't have to hold reserves against it. I think that's deplorable. I think it, the problem is so deep now that it's hard. You couldn't correct it now because you would cause a deflationary panic in Europe if you started raising uh, the risk weightings on sovereign debt. So they're caught here, but I think it's a terrible thing. But that gold is interesting. I'm going to have to go March 29th. I'm going to watch that. That's that's a very good point. That's why we do these things. So thank you, whoever <laughs> asked that question. <laughs> There's a question that's wondering, why is the stock market still running up, though we're on the verge of recession, the Fed has no levers left to pull us out of it? That is the penultimate question, and I can only answer it the way I ask when anybody calls friends, family. Cheap money is a very powerful thing, and money just got cheaper. So... And you and you wind up with you know with what Rick Santelli has discussed you know Tina 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 there is no alternative, uh, and I think a lot of people were sidelined looking you know this pivot by the Fed the quickness of this pivot caught a lot of people off guard and and let's face it the last quarter of 2018 people were shaken by that you know listen I changed a lot of my portfolio my stock portfolio uh, in the new year when the market started to rally back I started rejiggering my personal portfolio because that was a very intense period. So now a lot of fund managers, I think, were, were sidelined 
and they're now chasing this market, which is never a good thing. And and actually, I you know, it's this is a very good question because Jay Powell yesterday, I, when I wrote about it in my blog, because Jay Powell said this yesterday, which I found very interesting. He said, "We don't care about wage inflation. Our mandate's not wage inflation; it's price inflation. So if wages started going up, but prices didn't." Corporate profits are going to be hit, no matter how you do the math, that if if price inflation is going, you can't pass on those prices, but wage pressure is there, it has to come, wages have to come out of potential profits. So that question that this person asked is a very important question, because profits are definitely headed down. We're, we're trading at these levels because corporate profits are at all-time highs. They've been there for, well, they're not quite as high as they were a year and a half ago. But people have to think about that. No wage growth with all-time record profits for the last, you know, three or four years. That's what, you know, what I think elected Donald Trump, but that's a whole different discussion. Very uh, cool. So, Ira, we're going to have to cut it off here uh, just for folks to move on with their day. You are definitely someone that's uh, just full of information. We do have a few more questions. We apologize for not getting to them. You can always ask Ira uh, on Twitter, uh, he can be found yeah. at, uh, at at the uh, twitter.com forward slash y r a h a r r i s Ira Harris. <coughs> Excuse me, and then you can also get a hold of his blog at iragharris.com. Sorry, I'm coughing, and I just want to bow down and say thank you so much for taking time out of uh, precious time out of your day ira to come and teach us a lesson or two about seeing things in the bigger picture thanks everybody for joining and if you have any questions also you can reach out to us at uh, convergenttrading.com take care everybody and uh, have a great night take care thanks mark